the few in the crowd <laughs> taking it out through the variety before Thanksgiving. Um, we are very pleased to have Kristen Linquist here today. Uh, she is from UNC's Department of Psychology and Neuroscience, and um, she's going to talk about uh, the hypothesis of emotional aging and deconstructing emotion across adulthood. And you know, I love having talks where I come in knowing like nothing. <laughs> so I was looking at the work that Kristen does, and I mean, there's all this cool stuff like neuroimaging and you know, uh, language and emotion. And so uh, um, I'm super excited to hear what she has to say. Um, she's a psych psychologist uh, trained at Boston College and did a postdoc at Harvard. And I couldn't tell, did you join UNC right after that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I recognize that uh, I will probably be sharing methods today that maybe are not your usual bread and butter. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and in that vein, maybe you know, speaking language that is not your usual bread and bread, butter, butter either. So um, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask them, um, clarifying questions throughout. Um, I joked that I was going to apologize for this font, and indeed I am going to apologize for this font. Um, this was a Mac PC conversion. I did not volitionally choose that kind of jazzy looking font, but I think from here out it's going to be uh, better. Okay, um, so I wanted to start off by telling you a little bit about the work that I do uh, in my lab um, over in the psychology and earth science department. And um, my lab is ultimately interested in how the neurobiology of emotions, so the brain and the peripheral nervous system, interacts with the social and cultural worlds in which we live. Um, and really, we study how the confluence of those two processes combine to produce the experiences that people have day in and day out, day out like anger and sadness and fear and joy and schadenfreude, right, you name it, um, the various emotional experiences that we all have. And increasingly, we're really studying this across the lifespan. So from uh, birth on up to old age. Now, before we go much further, I want to sort of lay some groundwork here and tell you um, a little bit about how I'm thinking about what emotions even are in the first place, right? In some ways, this is a very difficult study to talk, uh, topic to study because people have emotions, right? Everybody has your own sort of intuitive model about what emotions are. Um, psychologists, as it turns out, have debated this question for really centuries. Um, and really, if you go back to antiquity, you can see people arguing about what the definition of emotions should be. But what I can tell you is that most scientists who study emotions agree that emotions involve some sort of psychological appraisal that is meaning making of the situation, meaning making of your own internal state in light of context some sort of physiological change in your body and your nervous system more generally, some sort of behavior. Um, obviously, not all emotional experiences involve overt behavior. However, it's thought that emotions are maybe linked to these sort of behavioral action tendencies. And of course, feelings, right? So uh, people most prototypically think of emotions as states that involve some sort of subjective feeling. And uh, increasingly, many people argue that this subjective feeling happens somewhere within your corporeal form, right? Um, so increasingly, if you ask everyday people, what are the qualities that make something emotional? They say, well, it involves something about like feeling states in your body. You know you're having an emotion because it's somewhere in your body. Now, increasingly neuroscientific models of emotion agree that this is true to an extent. So um, what I'm going to show you here is a model um, that is a newer model of emotion that is based on what we call predictive brain models. Um, and this is a whole can of worms. I could give a whole other talk on uh, the predictive brain, but the logic here is that brains work efficiently because they predict what is going to happen next before it actually predicts. 
So imagine that somebody throws you a baseball and you go to move your arm as the baseball is actually reaching where your arm would be in space. <clears throat> you would miss it, right? So actually what your brain is doing is it's modeling the trajectory of the baseball and anticipating where it's going to be in space so that you can move your arm up in time to catch it. And this is why some people aren't very good at catching baseball, right? Because <laughs> their brain has a bad model of where that's going to land. Um, and other people are very good um, because their brain has a good model of that trajectory. Now imagine that a um, lion was going to jump out of the bushes at you. If your brain waited until it had all the information in hand and said, that's a sound in the bushes, oh, something's emerging, oh, yep, that's a lion, then you would be, right? And so the idea is that the brain is using your prior sensory experiences in light of what's going on in your body right now to predict what is happening in the next few milliseconds of sensory experience. These predictions are not always correct, and so the brain is updating them as it goes, and those are called prediction errors. And so in this model, you have these brain regions here in blue and red and yellow, um, and they are part of a suite of brain regions that is using these prior experiences to make initial predictions. These are projected to the periphery of the body. We think of these as these initial sort of visceromotor predictions. So right now, let's say the brain is saying, I heard something in the bushes. It sounds a little bit like an animal in the bushes. It's going to make these initial visceromotor predictions that start preparing the body for action. Interestingly, it also sends those predictions to sensory cortices. So it's preparing the visual cortex to see something emerging from the bushes, for instance. And all the while, it is also receiving these ascending prediction errors to let it know if its internal model was in fact incorrect. Now, what I'm interested in in most of my work is these um, is these ascending prediction errors from, I may mean, not show yeah, that. Yeah, there's a pair. All right, I'm gonna use this thing. <laughs> okay, um, I'm interested in these uh, ascending prediction errors from the core of the body. And so what the body is always doing, what the brain is always doing is running this internal model of the body in the world that allows it to regulate its uh, metabolic demands. All right, um, what this model means is that the mind-body dualism that really has characterized much of Western philosophy and correspondingly psychology and really how we think about and live our daily lives where our mental contents are distinct from our bodily form is probably not very correct. Now, what this means is that the type of body that you have can in turn influence how you experience your emotions. And so for the remainder of the talk today, I'm going to focus on one aspect of my research on the role of the peripheral and central nervous system for emotion. And this is work that examines how emotions change as the body changes in aging. Now, zooming out, I don't have to tell this particular audience this, that understanding these mechanisms of emotion is important because emotions have really profound effects on the population level. And I don't have to tell this group that our population is rapidly changing, right? Um, so here we see the projected demographics in terms of age into 2040 and 2060. And what you can see is that the number of adults who are 65 and older is really going to increase. If these individuals are experiencing emotions in markedly different ways, then this can have profound impacts for all of the things that emotions impact. So just by way of example, um, oh, okay. to hit the button 17 times before it responded. Okay. 
touch it once. Let it do its thing. There we go. It's a little bit slow. <laughs> slow. Yeah. Okay. The whole um, mind body thing's not going well. It's not going exactly my mind and my body here. You're still, I think it's our machine. <laughs> Um, okay, so we know that emotions have profound impacts for health, um, not only in terms of health decision making, but that is certainly true. Um, but I'm talking about the ways in which felt emotional experiences in turn translate into disorders of physical health. Um, this is a, a model of allostatic load, right, in which stress translates into wear and tear on uh, the peripheral nervous system. Um, of course, emotions are also implicated in uh, wellness, mental health, well-being, the extent to which people thrive. Um, emotions impact decision-making. So uh, they do so for both good and for ill. Um, so they can facilitate context-appropriate decisions, but they can also, in turn, bias the decisions that we make. Emotions are key to having successful relationships, um, and there is evidence that having a relationship that is caring and uh, having access to people who care for you is as beneficial to your physical health as not smoking. And finally, emotions in young and even midlife can contribute to longevity. Ugh, there's that phone again. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm going to begin um, by uh, talking a little bit about what happens to our emotions as we age. Um, this is some pretty well accepted evidence, at least in the psychology of aging, but it may be new to you. Um, and then I'm going to share some newer evidence from my lab, suggesting that maybe there are some additional mechanisms through which um, age impacts how we experience our emotions. Okay, so there is a paradox of emotional aging. We know from uh, studies of aging that look at cognitive effects that there's a lot of downsides to getting older, right? When it comes to uh, executive control, so that is your ability to um, uh, switch tasks, uh, people have slowed motor function, uh, people experience age-related injuries and illness, um, people lose their social networks, right? As um, members of their social network are lost to um, illness or, uh, or just mortality in general. Um, and yet, amidst these very obvious downsides, there's some paradoxical effects with regard to people's emotions as they age. So people who are older, um, and here I'm talking about around 60 and higher, report better well-being than those who are younger. They report that they experience more positivity on a day-to-day -day basis. They report that they're better at emotion regulation, although that star is there because there's increasingly some evidence that they, that might not, not actually be true, um, but they certainly perceive that they are better at emotion regulation, and maybe that's, you know, half, half the way there. Um, they spend less time doing things that they don't want to do. And it seems like there may actually be some sort of uh, deliberative constriction of social networks going on, right? So people are implicitly or explicitly choosing to excise people from their social network who just sort of aren't working for them. Um, and there's actually some evidence that you can even induce this effect in younger adults by having them be more end focused, right? So seniors in college are less likely to spend time with people who they don't particularly want to spend time with than our freshmen because they perceive they don't have that much time left on campus, right? They're going to spend their time with the friends who um, are most meaningful to them. So you can see uh, these effects here um, in this really well-known U-shaped function that describes people's uh, degree of well-being across the age span. And this uh, is called the positivity effect. Well, really, this, this side of things is called the positivity effect that's observed in aging. 
And that is that people who are about midlife, well, greater than midlife. So people who are about 60 and on are starting to experience this upswing in the amount of positivity and well-being that they experience in daily life. Um, what the different uh, colors here are showing you are just this uh, regression, including more controls or fewer controls, um, so control variables such as people's sex, uh, marital status, SES, you know, those sort of variables that you might assume would be uh, influencing um, this particular uh, relationship here. And so it's a pretty robust effect. Everybody can find themselves somewhere on uh, the plot. I'm sliding down towards the nadir. Hopefully you're on the <laughs> other side. <laughs> Control for having young kids. Well, <laughs> I mean, I actually think that that is probably a large, a large um, <laughs> amount of what's, what's going on. Young kids, aging parents. <laughs> Daughter had headlights last night for the first time ever. So, you know, there we go. I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> You're sitting far away. Okay. Um, so these data have mostly been explained by two prominent psychological theories. Um, they are called socio-emotional selectivity theory and sort of expertise theory, right, which sounds like what they are. Um, socio-emotional selectivity theory is a theory put forth by a more participant who is at Stanford, who suggests that older adults are engaging in these motivationally driven behaviors to intentionally select how they spend their time, the result being that they experience more power. Right, so this is excising the people from your social network who just aren't that enjoyable to you. This is selecting out of situations that you know will be unpleasant. Choosing situations that you do find to be pleasant. Um, and there's a lot of support for, for this particular hypothesis. Older adults do indeed situation select more than do younger adults. Um, they intentionally attend away from negative stimuli more than younger adults do. Um, you can see that in eye tracking behavior where you're tracking where, where their eyes sort of automatically go to and fixate on. Expertise accounts are related um, to socio-emotional selectivity theory in the sense that they argue that older adults have a lifetime of experience of having emotions and therefore have acquired a number of uh, different regulatory strategies, they have acquired understanding of emotions that allow them to experience this greater effort. Now, what these theories don't account for is some of the other findings that are out there that come, uh, have to do with aging and emotion. So the first is that we actually know that there are some pretty profound changes to the nervous system with increasing age. Um, so certainly in the brain, in terms of brain structure and function, um, but also in terms of the peripheral nervous system. So there is peripheral nerve um, demyelination that occurs. This means that uh, signals don't transmit as easily and with as high fidelity through the peripheral nervous system from the brain to the body and back again. Um, there's also peripheral nerve death with increasing age. Um, I should say too that we know from measuring people's um, peripheral autonomic nervous system reactivity when they are experiencing emotions that they often have less robust nervous system responses as well. So. Um, very classically, if you expose somebody to a stressor, you see a nice robust increase in their heart rate, in the extent to which their heart is pumping blood into their peripheries, um, in their respiration, right? So a number of these different peripheral physiological markers. Um, these responses are reduced in older adults, even when controlling for sort of the intensity with which they um, find the situation to be evocative and, and important and so on. Um, 
There's also increasing evidence that older adults are less adept at sensing those changes in their bodies when they happen. So um, this is called interoception, and this refers to the ability to detect changes in your heartbeat. So if you pause for a second and just focus on your heartbeat as you're sitting here at rest, how many people think they can feel how when their heart is actually beating? That checks out. It's, it's a pretty normally distributed function. Um, and some people are very good at it. Some people are not so good at it. The way that we measure this is we measure your actual objective heart rate. And then we present tones that are either synchronous or asynchronous with that heart rate. And we can determine whether you are sensitive to the occurrence of your heart rate or not um, at rest. And uh, older adults compared to younger adults are um, significantly less sensitive at detecting those changes. Finally, we see some um, decrements in terms of behaviors that emotions are involved in older adults. So I'm showing you here these sort of odd looking faces. Um, these are some stimuli from a study that examined um, how, how people detect whether faces are trustworthy or not. Um, with this person uh, being judged on average as much more trustworthy than say that person, these are pretty robust effects. And people use these sort of gut-based decisions to drive whether or not somebody is trustworthy and helpful or untrustworthy and likely to be harmful to them. Um, and we know that people are sort of using these effective signals from their body to make these judgments. Older adults are less likely to use those signals and in turn are more likely to place undue trust in this guy um, than that guy. That is to say that they are equally trustworthy. Um, and this links to evidence that uh, older adults are statistically more likely to be sort of taken by scams, that younger adults are more likely to see through and so on. So these findings are, have not been well accounted for by these prominent models of emotional aging. And so my lab set out to try and uh, come up with a hypothesis that might actually unite both the good and the, the more maladaptive outcomes that we see in emotional aging. And we call this the physiological hypothesis of emotional aging. The idea that as your uh, body ages and features of your peripheral and central nervous system are changing and you know, features of your body more generally are changing, that this uh, is changing how it is that your brain is receiving signals from your body during emotions. So coming back to this model, this means that either the brain is, um, is differing in those signals that it sends to the body during emotion or in the signals that are returning back from the body to be reincorporated into ongoing experience. Any questions at this? Sure. Um, let's see back here. Okay. Um, so the first thing that I want to show you is it's somewhat of a concept proof. Um, and this is a concept proof that was important to do in psychology because there are some psychologists who have said. Sure, emotions are these sort of central nervous system states that cause changes in the body, but those in principle have nothing to do with ongoing emotional experiences, right? Those are sort of the outputs of emotions, and it doesn't matter what those are because the experience has already been sort of let out of the gate, right? Um, so we wanted to show that indeed, if you were to temporarily block people's representation of the peripheral body, that this would in turn change the intensity of their emotional experiences. Um, we did this using pharmacological blockade with the beta blocker propranolol. 
Um, so this is taken typically for uh, blood pressure uh, control and, and other types of um, cardiovascular symptoms. Um, although apparently some performers take it off label to uh, help with their anxiety when they're on stage. Um, suggesting that maybe it is indeed sort of playing this, this more emotional role. Um, this was done by a former PhD student of mine um, and my colleague, Keely Muscatel, who was in psychology and neuroscience with me. So um, this was a double blind randomized controlled trial in which we gave young adult participants, um, this is why this is a concept proof. These are young folks who we are temporarily blocking the um, ascending information from their periphery during emotion. So they either received 40 milligrams of propranolol or a placebo. Um, we waited for the drug to activate, um, and then they went through uh, this trier social stress test, which is a very common form of stress induction in the psychology literature. And basically it's this, right? So you stand up in front of a group of people <laughs> and um, in this case, you give an impromptu speech. So more stressful than this because I know what I'm saying. Um, they are asked to give an impromptu speech on their dream job and to perform mental math um, in their head in front of the audience. Um, they have these two impassive interviewers who are not giving them very much feedback at all. So that's those talks that you give where people just look at you like there or something <laughs> like um, class. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like some undergraduate classrooms where you're like, oh. um, and uh, we measured their EKG and cardiac impedance, um, which are these autonomic um, measures of um, sympathetic nervous system activation. We also asked them afterwards to report on their emotions. So I'm going to show you first their pre-ejection period. This is cardiac pre-ejection period, which is a pretty pure marker of sympathetic innervation to the heart. Um, so sympathetic sort of fight or flight activation. Um, and what you can see is that um, Certainly before they took the drug, there's no difference in their PEP. Um, you can see as the drug is beginning to work, you are starting to see a difference in PEP. And then during the stressor, there is a, a marked difference in the extent to which people who are on propranolol are having these physiological responses. That's not surprising, right? This is just showing you that the drug is actually working. What is interesting is people's self-reported emotional experiences. So here I'm showing you the extent to which they felt a range of negative, sort of highly activated emotions. Um, and what we see is again, no difference when they're not doing anything stressful, that makes sense. Once they uh, start experiencing something stressful, you see that the folks who are on propranolol are experiencing their uh, state as far less stressful. Interestingly, we did measure the extent to which they were sort of perceiving features of the situation. So, you know, to what extent did you find the interviewers to be sort of threatening and unpleasant? Um, and the, the people on drug and not on drug did not differ in those perceptions. So it's not like it was changing their experience of the situation. It was changing their experience of their own internal state. So... Uh, this is some initial evidence for this idea that changing how it is that the brain is sending these efferent projections to the body and then representing these afferent projections um, from ongoing peripheral nervous system changes contributes to emotional experiences. And what we are predicting is that aging may, in effect, produce a similar effect to this, right? As people are aging and increasingly they're receiving less information from the periphery, or at least the fidelity of that information may be um, less, that this in turn will change their emotional experiences. So we have tested this in a number of different ways at this point in time. I'm gonna share with you um, four studies today, I think. Um, so, in the first study, um, we simply used some behavioral methods to ask people, 
how it is that they uh, experience their emotions. Um, and I'll tell you about that in a second. Um, in a second study, we again ask people to, um, in essence, tell us uh, what their understanding of emotions is. In a third study, we had people in daily life self-reporting on their emotional experiences. And so these are all sort of um, through the lens of self-report or people's sort of explicit um, linguistic representations of emotion. In a fourth study, we performed a neuroimaging meta-analysis. I'll explain more about that later, but we took a number of different studies from the literature that have performed neuroimaging while people experience emotion in the scanner, in young versus old folks, and um, meta-analyzed those findings to reveal sort of what are the consistent findings across the literature. Um, and I'll close by sharing the work that we're doing now, which is actually a prospective study in which we are measuring people's emotions in daily lives, really combining all of these things together. Um, we are measuring their peripheral autonomic reactivity while experiencing emotions in the scanner, um, measuring their brain activity and functional connectivity, um, and uh, measuring their ability to, to intercept or sense their body states. That is ongoing, and I will not have uh, findings to share, but hopefully that will be the uh, coup de gras here. Um, okay, so in this first study, we had 150 adults um, who ranged in age from 18 to 72, um, complete a set of, uh, this was a nationally representative sample, and they completed a bunch of questions. So very straightforward. They completed questionnaires that were these sort of self-characterizations in general of their body awareness, the link between the body and emotion, the extent to which they saw a link between the body and emotion, um, the clarity with which they experienced their emotions, their attention to emotion, and sort of their efficacy of regulating um, their body during emotion. What we found is that as age linearly increased, people reported less intense, oops, uh, less distressing body sensations, less intense body sensations, um, a lesser association between the body and emotion, less clarity about one's emotions. And with greater age, they reported they were more efficacious about body changes and that they paid more attention to emotion. So, you know, take this with a grain of salt. This is people reflecting on their own experiences, right? This is really as good as people are at sort of intuiting what's going on in their own psychology and their own bodies. But interesting nonetheless in this cross-sectional sample that we are seeing uh, people on the older end of the spectrum as reporting sort of less involvement of the body and emotion than younger adults. Can you give an example of like a self-reported question on yes. intense body sensation? Yes, definitely. Um, let's see. So okay, so that was from um, a questionnaire that would ask things like um, my when I feel emotions, my my it feels so intense inside my body, I can't do anything about it. So this was kind of um, statements. Um, and yeah, distressing was, was comparable. So, you know, when I feel body sensations, um, I find them to be very mm -hmm. disruptive. Um, and yeah, clarity is when I, I'm aware of, of what I'm feeling. My feelings are um, clear and obvious to me. So to me. Okay. Um, so that was really sort of a first foray into this question. And so we designed a, a second study in which we asked people to perform this property associates, uh, property verification task. So this is a cognitive task that's used in sort of the cognitive psychology literature. And it's a way in which you can um, determine the extent to which people see certain properties as features of certain categories. And so participants 
um, performed a number of different trials that looked something like this. And we gave them an emotion category. We asked them, how much does a physiological, behavioral, or situational property come to mind for this emotion category? So here you are seeing a situational um, example. So how much does harm come to mind? But this could be how much does a beating heart come to mind when you think about anger? How much does punching come to mind when you think about anger? And so on. So they saw a number of trials like this that um, were randomly uh, associated with anger, sadness, disgust, fear, and boredom. So emotions that are sort of on the more um, unpleasant and sort of highly activated side versus unpleasant and lowly activated side. Um, and what I'm showing you here is the modeled data. So this was a, a multi-level model. So I'm showing you the estimated effects. And what we found was this curvilinear association such that past around the age of 45, people associated these physiological properties with emotion less than did younger individuals. That was significant and we saw no effects of age on these other properties. So this really specific effect of aging on people's sort of cognitive representations of emotion as involving these physiological properties. So again, we thought, well, you know, this is people's sort of concept knowledge about emotions, right? Like this might not have anything to do with how they experience emotions in the real world, so let's do a study where we actually sample their emotions throughout daily life. And so here we performed an experience sampling study. Um, what this means is that instead of asking people in general, when you experience anger, how much does your heart beat? There's all sorts of problems with doing that, right? People rely on sort of retrospective biases um, or sort of beliefs that they have that might exist in like the ether from culture, um, but don't necessarily represent their actual experiences. If you're asking people in the moment, closer in proximity to when they're actually experiencing those things, you're less likely to have um, those sort of biases enter. And so um, we had people perform something called the day reconstruction method that is intended to reduce those biases. So they reflected on the previous day and they told us first about the morning of the previous day. They reported on three different episodes of the morning. So this might look like, um, you know, I got up and I had breakfast and I put my kids on the bus and then I had a workout and then I went to work, right? Um, so they give you three different events, same with the afternoon, same with the evening. And then once they've isolated those event, events, they go back and they tell us more about them, including the emotions that they experienced during those events, as well as the extent to which they experienced physiological states, behaviors, and um, again, these sort of situational um, meanings. Again, this is a multi-level model. So these are the estimated effects. Um, here we found a linear association between increasing age and a tendency to report fewer of those physiological states when people experienced emotions. Um, again, this was not the case for the behavioral and the situational concomitants of people's emotional experiences. Okay. Um, so in my lab, we use a, a fair amount of physiological measures of emotion, the benefit being that they don't rely on messy things like self-report, right? You can have um, a more objective measure, perhaps, of what it is that people are experiencing. And so we thought, well, again, all of these self-report measures, even though they're telling us what people think they are subjectively experiencing, and there's certainly value in that, um, we wanted to know, well, what is happening in the brain and the body as people are experiencing emotion across age? Um, we have conducted a number of these neuroimaging meta-analyses. Um, the benefit of these is that 
they take this literature that tends to have some problems in it, right? So on the one hand, it's this nice objective measure of what's happening in people's brains when they are experiencing certain states. On the other hand, historically, those studies have been somewhat underpowered, right? It costs hundreds of dollars uh, to put people in the scanner for an hour, um, plus $575 per hour. Um, so it is not cheap to run these studies. Um, and so uh, we decided we would summarize this literature to quantitatively weigh in on what the consistent effects are. Um, so there were 26 studies at that time um, that induced emotion in people in the scanner um, by showing them scenes or having them engage in imagery or looking at human spaces, showing emotional expressions or hearing um, uh, emotional voices. I'm happy to talk about this later. These are all pretty standard ways of inducing emotion in the neuroimaging environment. Um, bear in mind that people are laying supine in a dark tube, and so you're sort of limited in terms of uh, what you can do. Um, and here we identified regions that were consistently coactivated with one another across studies. And I'll unpack that in a second. Um, so this is allowing us to say, um, which regions are showing activation across studies at rates that are greater than we would expect by chance, and which other regions are they coactivating with? So if region one is active across a number of studies, is region two also active? And when you do that, you can create these networks of functionally co-activated brain regions, um, the literature is moving towards this sort of network-based representation of how brain regions are really working together. Um, and so this allowed us to weigh in on regions that were functionally more co-activated in younger adults as compared to older adults and older adults as compared to younger adults. Now, I realize that folks in this room may not be <laughs> super familiar with looking at um, brain imaging results, but at least you can see that there are some differences here, right? So um, there's, these are glass brains. So this activation is actually happening sort of in the core in the middle of the brain. Um, this activation is happening very much sort of in the front of the brain. And so in older adults, what we saw was that activation was really sort of isolated in these prefrontal regions, whereas in younger adults, we saw activation that was um, more centralized in these brain regions that are involved in visceral motor control of the body, that is activating these sort of um, visceral efferents during emotion um, and engaging in motor control. In older adults, we see these brain regions that we really think of as sort of more cognitive, um, involved more in um, regulating behavior, perhaps. Um, and so this was at least some preliminary evidence from the imaging standpoint that younger adults are indeed experiencing perhaps this more sort of uh, physiological side of emotions, whereas older adults, it's frankly a little bit unclear from these findings what it is they're engaging in, right? They might be engaging in um, slightly more regulation, more reflection on their experiences. Um, it's also the case that with aging, we sort of see this shift towards more prefrontal processing. Um, and it's thought that that is compensatory for changes in the sensory modalities. Um, and so it may be that these sort of prefrontal um, localized activations are compensatory for a lack of you know, these more um, subcortical activations. But this is what we are addressing now in um, the final study that I'm going to uh, briefly uh, share with you today, um, which is an ongoing study. We're about 75% done. Um, this was funded in May 2020, so not a great time to start bringing older adults um, into uh, the scanner. And then it wasn't a good time to bring younger adults. It was, you know, Omicron and uh, the original variant for us for various loops. Um, but this study is um, 
prospectively following uh, participants. It's a cross-sectional study um, in which we are performing neuropsychological testing to make sure that uh, everyone is uh, aging normatively. Um, we're bringing in people from age 18 on up to age 80. Um, they do a number of uh, cognitive tests in a first laboratory visit, including that test of interoception that I mentioned earlier. So this heartbeat detection task, um, they perform a trust task, that is they um, see a series of faces that have been normed as having features that are more versus less trustworthy. Um, they engage in a number of different self-report characterizations. At that point in time, we set them up with a Fitbit and a um, app for their phone in which we um, can actually ping them multiple times throughout the day and ask them, this is you know, sort of the gold standard of experience sampling. Um, so if you're doing a study, you might actually get a, a little text on your phone right now uh, that says, how are you feeling? And you know, you fill it out and rate in the moment how you're feeling. So we're randomly uh, sampling people's experiences throughout the day. This is obviously thought to be much more ecologically valid and really to capture sort of people's um, variation in emotion in daily life. Um, from the Fitbit, we're getting their ambulatory physiology for a week, um, we're experience sampling for a week. Uh, Fitbit is also going to give us information about their sleep quality and so on. Um, and then they come in for a scan. Um, in which we are inducing motion by showing them stimuli that are evocative, pleasant, unpleasant, highly and lowly activated. Um, and what I'm really excited about is we are also collecting concurrent physiology, uh, peripheral physiology, while they um, experience those emotions. This is actually really rare in the imaging environment, I should say. Some measures are, are common. Um, getting that pre-ejection period measure that I showed you earlier is really rare uh, because as it turns out, really big magnets interfere with electrical signals. So it's hard to um, actually acquire that particular signal, signal in the bore of the magnet. Um, but we are one of the groups uh, in the country that are getting it right now. Um, and so what we're going to be able to test is the extent to which brain and peripheral nervous system are more or less connected as people age and how that maps on to the emotional features of people's day-to-day -day lives. So um, I hope uh, I will come back at some point and tell you about um, those particular findings. Um, and uh, taken together, we hope that this study is going to begin to shine some light on this question of how is it that uh, all of these changes to our physical self as we uh, go throughout life um, can in turn be influencing our psychology and in particular our emotions. Um, so with that, uh, I will say thank you. Um, thank you, we were part of this uh, grant um, uh, via my collaborator, Margaret Sheridan um, and Elizabeth. Uh, so we got a little bit of money to uh, contribute to this particular study. Um, and thank you all for uh, being here on the Friday before the <laughs>
sort of Eastern philosophy versus Western philosophy thinks about emotion, very different. Um, the, the drum that I am banging a lot recently is that psychology, mainstream psychology is very much situated in these sort of Western contexts and has imposed a lot of our sort of philosophical assumptions on um, the rest of the world. And as a result, I think we actually don't really know to what extent um, there are these underlying differences across different countries, but also like in, you know, sub subcultures within our own country. Um, people are starting to do that work and there actually are some pretty interesting and meaningful differences. Um, with relation to this sort of like embodied aspect of emotion, people have done relatively less work on that, but there's some interesting work, um, particularly in Eastern contexts like China, where um, that has looked at psychopathology. So emotion-based psychopathology like depression, for instance, um, here in the U.S., we define depression very much as having sort of an emotional component, right? Um, in fact, the, the DSM criteria are, have you been feeling sort of down and blue versus are you not experiencing things that are rewarding? Like those are the, the canonical features of it here in the West. Um, in these Eastern contexts, depression is thought of much more as this sort of like somatic physical state doesn't have the emotional components to the same extent, but people will talk about sort of like pains and um, it is like very embodied, which is interesting. Um, also, you know, imagine if you were a practitioner here trying to um, treat somebody who is from a different uh, cultural context. Um, so a lot more work <laughs> needs to be done uh, on that particular angle, but is really interesting. Um, the second question about emotions versus feelings, you know, people hotly debate these types of things in philosophy, obviously. Um, in psychology, we also hotly debate them and sort of comes down to like, what, what is your operational definition going to be? Um, I think about emotional experiences as having features of feelings, right? So they are characterized as being pleasant or unpleasant, sort of highly or lowly activated. Um, but there's lots of states that have those qualities, right? You can be sleepy. Is sleep an emotion? I don't know, right? Some people consider it as emotion. Um, you could be um, feeling ill. Illness certainly has those qualities, right? So some of the work that I've done has actually started to look at at sort of where the boundaries get blurred in these different physiological states um, that may or may not be experienced as emotion given the context. Um, I have this study that is, it's a little bit silly. It's probably like one of the most covered of any of the studies that I've done because we called it the hanger study. <laughs> and it is about, you know, when people are induced to feel hunger and then sort of misattribute those sensations to feelings of anger. And guess what? People are hung are hangry, right? Like when they um, are in a state in which they are low on blood, blood sugar and somebody does something that can be perceived as offensive, um, they're more likely when they're sort of not attending to their emotional state to um, become angry and sort of perceive that person as a jerk. Um, so not surprisingly, the media loved that. Um, but, you know, the science to it actually, I think is, is important, right? That we have all of these internal states on a day-to-day -day basis that, you know, how we're making meaning of them may really vary based on, on the context. Um, and there's important examples of this in the real world that, you know, when women go to the emergency room complaining of chest pain, they get told they have anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. Like there is a, a symptom in your body that a doctor in that case is misinterpreting for you, but like, many women go home and say, okay, you're right, it must have been anxiety, right? So um, many of these sensations, there's kind of no fact to the matter of them, right? It's all about how your brain is. Thank you. Hi. Um, I really loved your presentation. It was really clear, just like hearing all of these concepts from psychology. 
So I think there was a statement that you mentioned about like the type of body you have can influence your emotions. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on like what you mean by the type of body. Because yeah. when I think about it, I'm like, okay, are you thinking about body safe or like the level of activity? Um, and then I was also thinking, okay, are you conceptualizing this through age? So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I realize that is in many ways a loaded statement. Um, and I want to tell you what I don't mean by that. Um, so I, what I mean is something about the physiological functioning of the body that you are in has implications for the physiological functioning of the brain that you are in and correspondingly has functions for the physiological function or the uh, subjective experience of, of your emotions. Um, on the fringe, you can put that, push that in ways that I definitely don't mean. So I've had people say something like, does that mean like if you're trans, then you know, you're saying that whatever your sex assigned at birth is going to shape your emotions and you, you know, can't experience emotions. No, you know, no, no, uh, no statements about like what your specific genetics are or, you know, and that intersects with your identity. So anyways, we'll put that out there. Um, I do think that things about the, your health um, impact your physiology, right? So um, people who have diabetes, for instance, have physiology that is different from people who don't have diabetes that in turn influences how it is that their peripheral nervous system could in turn be processing emotional experiences. Um, people who have fluctuating hormones, there is some evidence that uh, fluctuating hormones do, can, there's another can of worms, um, can impact emotional experiences at certain points in that cycle. Um, and so, uh, you know, by and large, actually, there are no impact of fluctuating hormones on people's mood, um, but there are sort of like windows of vulnerability in uh, the month for um, people who have fluctuating ovarian hormones. Um, so those are the sort of like low level biological processes that I'm talking about that could sort of cycle up. Um, and so people will ask, well, does that mean if you exercise that you could have different emotions? And we're going to look at sort of variability in physiological health um, in the sample as a way of seeing, does that moderate some of these age-related effects? So those are the sorts of things that we're interested in looking at. Um, but thank you. I wondered if um, you could talk about the decision to cut off your current study at 80. Yes, um, that is really just a practical decision. Um, it So we have a number of things that make people ineligible to go in the scanner and that just skyrockets after 80. Even, even around like 65 and higher, it starts to get really hard. Um, and so what I will say about sampling for this particular study is we took a really like purist approach here that I actually don't think I will do in future studies. I'm just gonna put anyone in the scanner who is eligible to go in there safely and we'll co-vary that out later. But um, so we have, if anyone is taking any drugs that impact their peripheral nervous system, they are by and large excluded. If they, and so that's a, peripheral nervous system confound that we're worried about. Um, but then there's all sorts of things that have to do with just the scanner environment. Um, so if you have a pacemaker or stents or like any implanted metal in your body, you can't go in the scanner. Um, and so it just makes it increasingly hard to find people who, who can go in there. Um, what that means for this particular study is that we are going to be studying a subset of aging adults who are really, really, really healthy. Um, and you know that I'm comfortable with that for our first study. Um, the next time around, again, I think we're gonna ignore some of those criteria and worry about it on the back end um, because it will also just give us a more representative sample of like people who are actually aging in the real world and not the subset of 
really healthy Chapel Hillians that not be able. I will say we've made some pretty concerted efforts to get more representative in terms of SES and race and ethnicity than most studies have done in the past, but um, still, they're very healthy. Yeah. Question is, um, so in terms of where this is going from what you said at the beginning, so you're saying like ask people age, it could be that they're getting less messages up, so their mm -hmm. brain is model is being tamped down to mm -hmm. see things as less. Mm -hmm. But it'll be the other way that I said the stuff coming up and the brain saying, yeah, I don't need to worry about that because of experience. And so they're sending the message back and a bit of both. Is that yeah. how you're kind of thinking? Yeah, about that's it? a great question. Um, yes, I think it could be a bit of both. So it could be that as you accrue more experiences, you don't, your brain doesn't really need to care as much about what is actually going on in the body. Um, and we think that actually the, Flip is happening in adolescence, where you know the brain has developed this model of the body, and then puberty hits, and then all of a sudden there's all this crazy information coming up from the body, and um, you know we have some working hypotheses that have to do with the onset of depression in, um, particularly in women in adolescence, and so you know there's an example of of the opposite happening where the brain all of a sudden is saying oh, there's all sorts of information in this body that I'm not predicting very well. It may be that older adults have a predictive model that is pretty well attuned. Um, and so they're just processing less prediction error. Um, that gets really tricky to test um, and will require some um, like more sophisticated imaging methods. But right now we're just trying to show that the body has anything to do with it as sort of a first pass. But yeah, that would have been interesting. Great. We're pretty much out of time. So thank you very much.